Hello. <clears throat> My name is Doug Judd, and I am the CEO of Hypertable Incorporated. I am also the um, original creator and current maintainer of the Hypertable project. And uh, today I'm going to give an architectural overview of Hypertable um, within the context of some of the other scalable database technologies. Um, and at the end, I'm going to give uh, some pre preliminary results from a benchmark um, that we're running comparing uh, Hypertable with HBase. <coughs> so Hypertable, what is it? Hypertable is a high-performance, open-source, scalable database modeled after Google's... Oh. Is that better? <clears throat> OK. So Hi Hypertable is a high-performance, open-source, scalable database modeled after Google's Bigtable. Um, to give you a little background on the project, about three years ago, um, the project got started about three years ago. I was working as an architect at Zvents, which is a local search engine. And at the time, we were trying to become the quote-unquote Google of local search. And that meant collecting massive amounts of click log data and query log data and doing analytics over that data and then feeding the result of those analytic calculations back into the ranking algorithm, the recommendation systems, and the ad targeting systems. Um, so we identified early on that we wanted to get the back-end engineering process shifted onto scalable computing technology. And at the time, Hadoop existed, which provided the uh, scalable file system and the MapReduce framework. But there was no open source solution for delivering massive data sets to live applications. So we decided to go ahead and, and, and build one. And big tables uh, seemed like the obvious choice. Um, and we decided to do open source so that we could reap all the benefits of the open source um, development model. Now, one of the big focuses of the Hypertable project has been on performance. And the reason is simple. We strongly feel that um, efficiency gains scale linearly with the system. So for, for many workloads, that has the effect of reducing the amount of hardware required to deliver the same capacity, which ultimately lowers cost. Now, even and to that end, we implemented the system in C++. Now, even though the system's implemented in C++, we have a Thrift interface that provides bindings for all the popular high-level languages. <clears throat> so Bigtable, this slide's a little background on Bigtable. Bigtable is one of Google's most important pieces of scalable computing infrastructure. Over 100 services at Google are built on top of Bigtable including pretty much every major service you can think of. YouTube, Blogger, Google Earth, Google Maps, the list goes on. So the, the nice thing about choosing the big table design is that it's proven to work well in practice. All right, so what, what, is it, what does it offer you? So Hypertable gives you the ability to create and manage massive tables of information. Um, or sparse tables of information. And by sparse, I mean one row can have literally a million columns, and the next row can have two columns. And that's stored very efficiently. Um, now, each table is sorted by a single primary key index, and each cell in the table can have multiple time-stamped revisions. So it's well-suited for applications that do um, versioning or historical archiving. Um, so what is it not? It's not a relational database. Currently, we don't support joins, secondary indexes, or transactions. They're on the roadmap, but we don't support them now. Now, for secondary indexes, they can be easily simulated inside the application by creating a secondary table whose primary key is the foreign key of the, of the original table uh, with pointers back into the original table. Um, but currently, it needs to be done at the application level. OK, so here's uh, some Hypertable deployments. Our biggest one is Baidu, uh, the leading search engine in China. They have a 120-node Hypertable deployment managing 
over 200 terabytes of data. Uh, Rediff.com, they're the largest India-owned and operated web property. Um, they've got Hypertable deployed in a number of places and are deploying it um, throughout their service. And a, a number of other ones here as well. Um, okay, so this is the... Um, this is the part of the talk where I go into the architectures. Um, I'm going to start with some of the other scalable um, database architectures and then um, end with a hypertable architecture. Now, admittedly, I'm sort of focusing on some of the uh, weaknesses of the other architectures, but to be fair, I <laughs> I'm going to uh, highlight some of the weaknesses of the big table architecture as well. Okay, so one uh, popular uh, architecture is called auto sharding, and it's basically what these systems do is they take table data, s chop it into horizontal shards, and then manage the shards in separate databases running on separate machines. Um, here's some example of auto sharding systems. Aster Data and Greenplum actually use Post Postgres as the the database that manages the shards. Uh, Mongo has implemented their own um, um, database. So this is, uh, I stole this from the Mongo presentation. Um, basically, this is the 10,000 foot overview of uh, what Mongo looks like. You have clients connecting to these Mongo servers, and then they communicate with the config servers to figure out the mapping of you know which keys go to which uh, sets of machines. And then on the back end, you have these they're either shard machines or they can be shard clusters. Um, so the weakness here is that um, if you essentially specific data is tied to specific machines. So for example, in if this box up here on the left, let's say that's a, a, a shard group of with three three machines, master and two slaves. If you lose one of those machines, you suddenly have an imbalance of, um, or, or you have a vulnerability for that piece of your data set. And until you actually replace the machine, copy the data back over onto the machine, that vulnerability will exist. Um, and in addition to that, you have to have plenty of spare machines standing by to, to come in and replace failed machines. In other words, you can't, even if the other machines in the system have plenty of spare capacity, you can't use that spare capacity to rectify uh, machine failure. So the next, uh, the next uh, uh, scalable data store architecture I'm going to go into is the, the Dynamo-based hash table architectures. And um, there's a number of them. Um, the most prominent would be Cassandra, Voldemort, and uh, React. Um, so to give you some background there, um, Dynamo is a, a database system developed by Amazon.com to handle their shopping cart. Now, one of the key requirements to the Dynamo system or to the system that they were developing is very high write availability. So the last thing that they wanted was for a customer to try and place an order and not be able to because server error. So um, they developed this eventual consistency system, which basically allows you to kick off writes to all the replicas and then turn around and, and return a success when you've only heard back from a subset of them. Um, which is, you know, it's fine, it's a good design. Um, it, it can lead to some problems where um, some of the um, updates didn't make it to some of the replicas, and so what they do is they employ a system called read repair, where, where they read from some number of the replicas and essentially repair the data uh, on the read end. Um, it uh, uses this technique called consistent hashing, and um, just briefly, Okay, I, I saw this in a couple of presentations yesterday, so I'm sure you did as well. But basically, it takes um, it, it, it to handle the mapping. It it, it creates this ring of, of real numbers going from zero to one, and <clears throat> all the machines 
in the system will map to a point in this ring. And then all the keys that are um, written into the system essentially go through a hash function and then map onto this ring. And so, as you can see in this green highlight area, node C is responsible for all the keys that map um, on that segment of the ring from node C to node B. And likewise, node B is responsible for those and so on. Um, so the, the, I guess the, the main thing here is it's really designed for, for hashing. We have a hash table um, because you want, want to have an even distribution of keys around this ring. Um, so what, uh, what Cassandra has done is they've implemented something called the order preserving partitioner. And basically, they do order preserving hash. And, and essentially, what they do is they take keys and um, they, they map them on, they basically directly map them into an integer, which, which um, translates to a point on the ring. And I took this from the order preserving partitioner. When they go to add a node, they'll take um, the, a, a large segment and, and find the midpoint and partition it there. And this is how they find the midpoint. They take the two keys that represent the, the, the ends of the segment. They convert them directly into an integer, add them together, and divide by two. And I actually literally did this. I took the code, the Java code, and plugged the two endpoints in, and it spit this thing out as the midpoint. Um, now, the issue there is that if you have non-uniform distribution of keys, you can end up picking a midpoint that's that's skewed, where all the data is on 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 one half of the um, or on one one of the segments. So that's that's the one sort of weakness I would say of the Cassandra design. But if your if your data is somewhat uh, uniform, then then it works fine. Okay, hypertable arch architecture. So this is a conceptual layout of uh, a hypertable. Um, you can see there's, um, this is the crawl database. Um, it was taken from the Bigtable paper. Um, each row is a um, URL. And I've got three column families listed here. There's title, content, and anchor. And the, the stacked effect is supposed to illustrate the multiple timestamped versions of each cell. Um, so one um, interesting thing about um, the big table design is it supports what's called column qualifiers. <clears throat> so in this case, the, the anchor column can actually have, for each row, um, multiple qualified instances of the column. And in this case, the, the uh, qualifier is the remote URL that is pointing back to this um, uh, facebook.com and the content of the cell is the actual anchor text so that's how that's how this feature c came about um, now this three-dimensional um, representation actually just flattens out into a sorted list of key value pairs um, the key being the the row key the column qualifier and the timestamp so if you look through the code you'll see a lot of um, sorted list of key value pairs. Um, so this is, uh, this is basically how um, uh, Hypertable scales. Um, tab conceptually, we've got two tables here. Um, all, all tables start out in life as a single range. And as data gets inserted into the, the table, uh, the range will grow and grow and grow and hit a threshold, and it'll split in two. And half of the range will stay there, and the other half will get reassigned to a new machine. So in this case, you can see there's three servers here um, managing a bunch of different ranges from the two tables. And as you can tell, they've hit capacity. So to scale, uh, it's simply a matter of adding two new machines. The system will detect that it's got two new uh, machines available, and it will auto-migrate ranges from the overloaded machines onto the new machines, thus having a balancing effect of load across the entire cluster. Um, 
So now uh, I need to point out a weakness of the hyper table design. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so the one weakness is that because you have a single machine managing um, um, each range, if the machine goes down, there's a period of time when that range will be unavailable while the system figures out that, oh, the machine went down, I need to reassign the management of that range to, or those ranges to, to other machines. So during periods of failure, there can be latency spikes. Okay, so this is kind of a coarse view of the, the Google architecture. Um, on the bottom layer, you have the Google file system. And this is a scalable, highly available file system that uh, takes file data, chops it into chunks, rep replicates three chunks across some number of machines so that you can, like by default it's three, you can lose two machines and the data is still available. Uh, then there's the MapReduce and then um, Bigtable, which actually sits on top of GFS. So Bigtable doesn't actually persist any data itself. All of its state is persisted in the GFS. Um, and the nice thing about this design is that the um, data replication is all pulled down into a single subsystem. Um, so you don't have data replication in your data database and your logging system and any other scalable system that you're putting together. All the, the replica data replications handled in one spot. So this is kind of a, illustrates how um, um, machine failures work in uh, the Google file system. We've got six chunk servers here. Um, these uh, colored boxes represent uh, chunks. And when a machine goes down, what happens is the chunks that it was managing get replicated by other machines in the system. And so the nice thing about this is that you have mul multiple machines in the system handling failover. You don't have a single machine that has to be put in its place and have the data copied. The data will automatically get replicated on the spare capacity in all the other machines. So this is the hypertable 10,000 foot overview. Um, this big cloud here at the bottom is the, the, the distributed file system. The one that we run on top of typically is uh, the Hadoop distributed file system. Now on each uh, machine, uh, or the, the bulk of the machines in your cluster will be running a range server. And we've designed the system in such a way that um, the range server speaks to, to a DFS broker. And the DFS broker talks a normalized protocol to the, the range server and the specific file system protocol on the other side. And so what it allows you to do is run Hypertable on top of M any distributed file system that you want. And we've got um, brokers for HDFS, KFS, Ceph, and um, one called the local broker that just reads and writes to the local file system, which is useful for testing. Um, now, the basic design of the, uh, the range server is what's called the log structured merge tree. And essentially, what it does is it eliminates random I.O. And um, that's something you learn pretty quickly when you're dealing with massive amounts of data is random I.O. is bad. And so essentially the way this thing works is when updates come into the range server, the first thing that happens is they get appended to a commit log. And then they get put into an in-memory tree structure. And then period periodically in the background, that in-memory sorted map gets spilled out to disks which we call a compaction. And um, the, it, it's spilled out in sorted order on the disk. Um, and uh, periodically these files get merged up. Um, and so to, to execute a query, this is essentially what happens. The query comes in. There's this merge scanner um, abstraction inside the uh, range server. 
and it merges the cell cache, which is the in-memory data structure, and then all the on-disk cell stores does a heat merge, and um, get, that gives it a unified view of the, of the data. Now this is a, uh, a detail of our cell store format. They consist of sorted, um, compressed blocks of key value pairs. At the end, there's this uh, bloom filter, which I'll describe in a minute. And then after that is a block index, which is the last key in the block, followed by the block offset. So if you're, so when the system comes to satisfy a query, the first thing it does is it pages in the block index. It um, traverses it to figure out which block the, the query's um, data is gonna be in. It reads that block, uncompresses it, and then um, satisfies the query. Um, so those blocks um, are compressed with this compression framework that we've implemented, and um, it allows you to easily add different compressors. We support Zlib, LZO, QuickLZ, and uh, BMZ. The one that we use by default is um, LZO for the cell stores, and then for the the um, commit log, we actually use QuickLZ because it has a much faster compression speed. Um, okay, so as you can imagine, in this situation, we've added a lot of data. The, the number of those cell store files on disk can, can get pretty large. Um, so for example, let's say you had 50 cell stores. You have the cell cache and 50 cell stores. Well, if you come in to do a query, to satisfy the query, you have to look up in 50 files to figure out you know, the results, because you essentially have to merge those together, um, which would be prohibitively expensive, um, essentially 50 disk seeks per query. So what, what um, we've got at the end of each cell store is what's called a bloom filter. And the bloom filter, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's worth looking up. Um, basically, it's a, it's a big bit vector. It starts out all zeros. And whenever a key gets added to the cell store, that key gets run through some number of hash functions. Um, in this case, in this example, it illustrates three. And the result of those hash functions is an integer that gets modulo the size of the bit vector. And, and the positions of those three hashes gets set to one. So, so for every key that goes into the cell store, that process takes place, where the bits of their, of their hash functions get set to one. Now, when a query comes along, um, the first thing it does is it'll load that bloom filter into memory, and it'll run the, the key, the, qu the query key, into the three hash functions, and check the bit positions. If they're all one, it might be in there. If any of them are zero, it's guaranteed that that key is not in there because otherwise it would have been set to one when it initially got loaded up. So that's uh, kind of a neat optimization that, that helps us dramatically um, avoid disk seeks. Um, Hypertable has a number of different ca layers of caching. There's a block cache. Those block caches in the cell store files get um, cached in memory uncompressed, and there's a query cache, um, which just caches the results for um, uh, certain queries. Now, the nice thing about Hypertable is it's got this uh, dynamic memory adjustment. So inside, if you look inside the range server, there's a bunch of different subsystems that consume RAM, and um, but trying to guess how much, you really can't guess a priori how much RAM each subsystem sh should have because it's very much based on the workload. So for example, under very heavy write workload, you want to give much more memory to those cell caches, the, the in-memory map structures, so that they can grow as large as possible before spilling out to disk. Under read heavy workload, you want to give much more memory to, to like the block cache. Um, and so Hypertable actually monitors the workload and it will, it will adjust memory allocated to the various subsystems based on the workload. <coughs> okay, so this is a performance evaluation. Um, 
We're in the process of putting this together, so um, this, these are just some preliminary results. Um, so the test setup, um, we're using hypertable version 0.9.3.2, which hasn't quite been released yet, but should within the next week. And we're using the latest version of HBase. Um, and we're running on top of the latest version of uh, HDFS. Um, now this was a, a, a kind of a small test run on 10 machines. Um, HDFS was running on all 10 machines. Um, and then we had three hyperspace Zookeeper rep replicas. Um, and then a master and then four tablet servers running on a set of machines and then a test dispatcher and test clients running on a, a separate set of machines. So we kept the, the test um, clients uh, separate from the system so that they um, wouldn't become a bottleneck. And this is the machine profile. It's a pretty old machine. Um, yeah. So the first, um, so the first test that we, um, or there's a couple of tests here that we implemented. And basically, what we did is we took this essentially four-node hypertable and four-node HBase cluster, and we loaded um, uh, 80 gigs of data into these machines. Oh, oh, and by the way, it was uh, HDFS three-way replication. And um, did that, did a random write test, and then turned around and did a sequential read test. And in both situations, hypertable is about 70% faster. Um, and then the next um, test that we did was um, we tried varying the size of the data that we loaded into uh, hypertable and HBase, and we ran a, um, a or we did a random lookup test, and so this is uh, basically the random lookup test. And there was two um, random distributions that we used. We used the just a uniform distribution, purely random, and then the other one is uh, called Zipfian, and Zipfian is kind of uh, more realistic in the sense that it has. Um, there are more requests for the same item. So, so it better models sort of realistic workload. Um, and as you can see, um, the green bars are hypertable and the yellow bars are HBase. And um, um, part of, yeah, so, I mean, par part of why hypertable performs so well here is that it has that dynamically adjustable memory. If you look in the HBase source code, their block cache is hard configured at 20% um, of RAM. Okay, so uh, that's about it. There's, uh, here's a couple project resources. You can follow us on Twitter at Hypertable. And um, the main project is uh, hypertable.org. And, um, oh, five minutes? Oh, 15, okay. And we have now have a professional support organization um, if you're interested in getting professional commercial support for Hypertable. So that's it. Um, uh, are there any questions? Oh, do we use the append? Uh, no, we don't. Um, oh, okay. Um, so the question was, do we use uh, a custom version of the of the HDFS? And um, and the answer is no. Um, we we actually don't depend on the, the append operation. So. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, um, okay, so the question is, um, um, I, I mentioned uh, one of the, the weaknesses of the hypertable, big table design is that you can have these latency spikes. Um, and, um, 
it's uh, I don't really have any numbers there for and, and the question is is how 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 bad is it how how long can this latency be um, I don't have any numbers for you right now but it can be you know under certain scenarios it can be you know five to ten seconds that kind of a thing so but the but the theory is is that failures sure they happen regularly but the time in which the the machine is failing um, compared to the the overall time of all the machines being up that is a pretty short a very small amount of time so from an availability standpoint it shouldn't hurt um, well it's it's sort of baked into the design of the system it's hard you know it's um, we've talked about it um, but it's kind of the price you pay for fully consistent, um, sorted data structure. Um, uh, no. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. So the question was, um, does Hypertable support the ability to fetch um, ranges of your value, like byte ranges of the value, or and or is there a, a support for streaming? And um, uh, yeah, it, the answer is no. The system was really designed to handle smaller pieces of data. It was designed as the crawl database at Google. Um, so web pages were kind of the the target. Um, object I mean you can store large items but they get you know sent back to you as a large you know w one big thing um, yeah that, that could be part of it too I didn't do a whole lot of investigation I just took HBase out of the box ran it and um, yeah, so yeah, it'd be worth uh, trying it in the next release when they get that that working. No, all the all the data is persisted in HDFS. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. So the question was, if you lose a range server, is there, um, is there a possibility that you might actually lose, lose data associated with it? And the answer is no, because um, all of the state in Hypertable is persisted in HDFS. So HDFS handles a replication. And as soon as the machine goes down, um, uh, HDFS will start to, to re-replicate to get the replication factor up on all the blocks. Um, yeah, uh, so the question is, can you run MapReduce over Hypertable, and is it data locality aware? And the answer is yes. We've uh, implemented input and output formats for, for Hadoop, and um, as part of that process, um, we've implemented a, a basically a, t a table split map that uh, indicates where um, the ranges are, essentially. <laughs> well, so uh, why don't we merge with HBase and make one project out of both? Um, so briefly, w we actually started out working together. <laughs> this was about three years ago, um, and we had a disagreement early on about ch basically choice of implementation language. Um, they <laughs> They were keen on doing it in Java and becoming part of Hadoop, and I, I just couldn't do that. So I had to <laughs> fork and and do. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, question in the back. Uh, 
um, yeah, so the question is, are there any other query capabilities other than just primary key access? Um, I mean, that's the main, um, that's the main sort of feature, but you can, the query can take a, a pretty large predicate that has things like um, timestamp ranges. Um, with each cell, each cell has a timestamp, and so you can select based on the timestamp range. Um, you can specify the number of versions of the cell that you, that you want. Um, but yeah, at this point, it's mainly primary key access. We're going to add things like regular expression support in, in an upcoming release, but it's not in place yet. Oh. Oh, say that again? Oh, scanning? Yeah, yeah, there's a scanner interface. Any other question? Uh, yes. Well, I, because I think it's baked into the design, the way they manage, pass around the map of. Um, they use this gossip pro protocol to pass the map around. Um, I think there's situations where different nodes need to sort of identify the, the split point independently. So, yeah, I'm not sure. You, you might want to ask Eric over here. He better. Okay, question? Oh, the, the things that have been deleted? No, they are when you want to remove all key values there, so they're adding more key values there. Oh, okay. Well, so so one, okay, the, quest, the question is, um, what if um, you want to clean up old key value pairs that you've added um, 30 days ago? Um, well, currently there's no delete operation, but there, one thing that's supported is you can, um, each column family can have a TTL, which is a time to live field, and it will the system will only keep the most recent um, key value pairs that fall within that TTL window, and it will lazily um, purge them over time. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, thank you.